Now, ladies and gentlemen, the National Broadcasting Company brings you the latest news from abroad. Direct reports by our staff correspondents in foreign capitals. Now, we take you first direct to London. This is London, Ed Doy speaking. Few speeches of President Roosevelt have received as much attention as his Navy Day address last night. It was preceded by good advance publicity, and today the majority of morning papers held open their front pages to catch the speech in their last editions after four o'clock in the morning. Every editor picked out for headline display the president's words, damn the torpedoes, and the shooting has started. Several afternoon papers carried the full text of the speech. Considering that the papers are restricted to four ordinary sized pages, the full text took up about a fifth of the whole paper, including ads. It is too early for much comment, official or unofficial. In authoritative quarters, it was said that a prominent cabinet member, possibly Mr. Eden or Mr. Churchill himself, will make a public reference to the speech at the earliest opportunity. What newspaper comment has appeared is restrained and confined more to explanations of events in Washington than to jubilation or elucidation. The evening news said that in the face of the inexorable logic of events, the president threw out momentous challenges. The debates on them in Congress will be historic. On the people, the president's speech had a heartening effect in view of the gravity of the situation in the Far East and the none too cheerful news from Russia. Authoritative circles were inclined to regard the Soviet-Japanese frontier clash of last Sunday as an isolated incident from which no serious repercussions are to be expected. On the whole, however, a Japanese move is expected at any moment. Nobody professes to know in what direction the Japanese will move. Nervousness about Japan was especially noticeable in the financial districts. Japanese bonds continued to fall slowly, all bonds and shares of companies directly or indirectly interested in the Far East fell in sympathy. The news from Russia is considered gloomy in the short run, but not so from a long-range point of view. Authoritative circles believe that the Germans may be 10 or 15 miles from Rostov and 38 to 40 miles from Moscow. Some military experts believe that the Germans intend to break off the campaign for the winter after they have captured Rostov and made another determined attack on Moscow. In that case, the front will run northward from Rostov to include the whole Donetsk Basin, through Kharkov, through or just westward of Moscow, and then northeastward to Leningrad. The Caucasus oil fields are regarded as a front apart, and there may be activity there throughout the winter with a perpetual threat against Turkey. Reports that the Russian forces which helped the British have been withdrawn from Iran to take up positions for the defense of the Caucasus are officially denied in London. The Russians, it is said, are not as short of, of troops as all that. King George of England has sent a message of good wishes to the president of the newly created Syrian Republic, Taj ed-Din el-Hassani. The message means that the British government has officially recognized Syria's independence as proclaimed some weeks ago by the Free French commander, General Catru. The independence, it was stated, is not conditional, but it is probable that the independence accorded is for the duration of the war conditional on a defensive alliance between Syria and the Allies. The recognition procedure adopted has set international legal experts scratching their heads. There is no doubt that the League of Nations, whose approval would ordinarily have had to be obtained, was bypassed. This, it was stated, is not because the League is considered dead, but only dormant because of war conditions. London has ready for emergency the biggest combined catering scheme yet evolved. The scheme would be ready to function immediately the London, London County Council considered it necessary. West End hotels and workmen's dining rooms, clubs, tea shops, milk bars, and pubs have united to perfect the organization in which each will serve alike. Menus will be standardized. A cup of tea would cost one penny. Soup, tuppence. Stew would be ten cents. And all this would be available in West End hotels or East End coffee stalls. It is emphasized that this blitz feeding would only be introduced if the emergency were really grave. 
but it is ready to function immediately. I return you now to the National Broadcasting Company in New York. Now, some late dispatches as received here in the newsroom in New York. Uh, this one is dated Moscow. Today's Soviet communique gives no details of the fighting at the front. It says only that Russian and German troops fought overnight in the same sectors of prolonged conflict before Moscow and in the Donetsk Basin. Hitler's armies are said to be 38 to 40 miles from Moscow at the nearest point. And from Tokyo, the Japanese news agency says that an American soldier has been shot by a Chinese in Beiping. The soldier's name is not given, nor whether the shooting was fatal. He is said to have been on duty in front of United States barracks at the time the gunman escaped. And now next day to report direct from the Reich. Here is Alex Dreyer speaking from Berlin. Hello, NBC. This is Alex Dreyer in Berlin. Official German comment today to the president's speech is again keynoted by the use of such words as swindle, forgery, stupidness, and fantasy. A propaganda ministry spokesman branded the speech as a swindle from beginning to end. He said that the president's statement to having in his possession a so-called secret Nazi map of South America represents the height of falsification. The spokesman said that no such map exists, and if one does, he added, then it's a pure case of forgery. On the other side of the Willemstrasse, the foreign office spokesman, who tonelessly commented for 20 minutes, told correspondents that the speech surpasses anything thus far in idiocy and shamelessness. The foreign office spokesman put the question, is it the speech of a man who has lost his mind or that of a political criminal? He talked in a low, quiet voice and compared the president with the old German king, Ludwig II of Bavaria, who, according to the foreign office spokesman, also had his days of mental abnormality. The spokesman said that the only reaction the German government could give was not political, but medical. D&B maintains that the president has reached an all-time high in fantasy. News from the Eastern Front this afternoon is again limited. The high command says that the pursuit of the retreating enemy in the Donetsk Basin continues. The communique maintains that German troops yesterday fought their way into the town of Kramatorskaya, about 112 miles southeast of Charkov. The Russians are said to have lost thereby one of their largest tank manufacturing plants. Other industrial towns, according to the communique, were captured by Hungarian troops. Although not mentioned by the High Command, reports here assert that the Luftwaffe yesterday again directed rolling attacks against Soviet lines of communication south and east of Moscow. Seven railway lines are said to have been bombed. The High Command today again holds back all details on land fighting along the Moscow front, beyond saying that operations are in progress. Seven years before the Nazis came to power, Dr. Joseph Goebbels was made Gauleiter of Berlin by Hitler. And today in the German press, which he controls, Goebbels pays tribute to the Berliner in an article titled, 15 Years Gau Berlin. Goebbels says that the Berliner has handled himself during the two years of war in a manner which deserves high praise. But he says the Reich capital must excel in discipline, in national enthusiasm, in national solidarity, and in proud toughness of its political attitude. Goebbels admits that since the war started, some families have gone without sufficient coal to heat their rooms, and that the difficulties of transportation, as he put it, has at times affected the supplies of vegetables, including the potato, as well as cigarettes and cigars. But Goebbels adds, it was a pleasure to see how the Berliner mastered the difficulties. The propaganda minister, who was a Rhinelander, states he is proud that the capital has never reproached him for not being a Berliner. The people of Berlin, he concluded, are good-humored. The German press today publishes a long list of radio stations, which Goebbels says the Germans and people in the occupied countries are allowed to listen to. There are 84 stations listed, some of which indicate the trend of the more recent German conquests. Listed already are Smolensk and stations in Lithuania, Estonia, and Latvia. The BBC is not listed among the stations and strangely enough, neither is Radio Rome. This is Alex Dreyer in Berlin, 
Now returning you to NBC in New York. And that's the latest news on the war. Now for word of developments at home, here is Earl Godwin speaking from the newsroom in Washington. Good morning, folks. You know, it's rather difficult to make a, a just a plain news report after you've had your main stuff stolen from you from by London and Berlin. Really, they put up two extremes on the present speech. I think the London attitude is a little more... Well, it's completely London with, with uh, uh, Washington as a contrast. But the Berlin attitude seems to, would seem to us here to be perfectly ludicrous because if this thing gets going, what uh, the Berlin people will need isn't good medical advice. It'll be something else. And when it comes to the ravings of a madman... Those boys over there who've heard Hitler on many an occasion certainly ought to be expert on that stuff by now. Well, the president's orders to the American Navy are not only to shoot on sight, as you heard last night, but damn the torpedoes, go ahead. Words by Admiral Farragut, uttered by him when he was lashed to the crow's nest, high above the deck of the gunboat in Mobile Bay, with the black smoke clouding the view from the deck. He climbed up there after feeding, after letting the crew drink all the coffee they wanted that morning and no rum. And words which were again used by Admiral Dewey, I think it was at Manila Bay, authentic words to be used by this American president on Navy Day. At least it's thought so here in administration quarters. It's taken to mean an actual part in the war by London editors, have you as you heard, and according to the news, which is trickling over here now, the president outlined a greater part in the war against Nazism. But so far, he outlined it as a part of delivering the goods, but shooting our way over there if necessary. A naval war, a naval combat, or naval hos hostilities without a declaration. But immediately, Senator Wheeler of Montana, and you know where he stands, comes out with a statement that if the things Mr. Roosevelt fears and says are true... Why not ask for a declaration of war now and not sneak in by the back door? Of course, the big news, I think the one piece of news in the speech, outside of the news of its tone and declaration, was the disclosure of that thing which Alex Dreyer said the Germans spurned. The, uh, the map showing Nazi plans to divide South and Central America into five zones and include the Panama Canal under Nazi puppet regime also the plan to wipe out all religion and displace God with Adolf Hitler. Despite the fact that the Germans sneer and laugh and say there's no such map in existence, I think it is at least two or three years ago that I heard rumors here in Washington from very secret high places that general orders to that effect had been found by American counter-espionage officers and placed in very secretive places so that even all the cabinet officers didn't know anything about them. Well, and as expected, the president took a crack at John Lewis when he called for expansion and production, declared there should be no obstruction either from greedy industrialists or selfish labor leaders. Every coal mine must produce, said the president, but right now the mines John Lewis closed are idle, and Washington awaits the next step in the forthcoming showdown. It's likely the developments will wait until Wednesday or Thursday after Lewis and Myron Taylor meet. The president has made three appeals to Mr. Lewis, to which the mine labor union chieftain has made no reply to the first, said no to the second, and no comment to the third. Congress is upset over the strike situation, has offered further and drastic legislation to stop the defense industry strikes, but so far the administration has brushed aside these suggestions and unless something is done, I think the president will now ask for legislation or open the mines by the government. And that's all from Washington at this time. Thank you, Mr. Godwin. Now we've heard from Ed Doyce in London, Alex Dreyer in Berlin, and Earl Godwin in Washington in another of NBC's morning news roundups. Keep tuned to this station for the latest news. This is the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs> <laughs> 